One aspect of the technosphere that is particularly challenging but also offers some great possibilities, and by the technosphere what I mean is this interpenetration of the, the internet and its technology into all sorts of aspects of our life in ways that, that are ongoing and, and are quite radically new, uh, especially for those of us in generations that, that grew up before the internet. Uh, so anyway, one of the, the aspects that's, that's particularly interesting is our access to news. And I think that we get, in many respects, at least at this time, deeper and broader access to news through the Internet than we do through other news outlets like the television or radio um, or, or print journalism. There, there are certain certain ways in which I would say, especially with print journalism, um, you, you, know, you don't want to dismiss it altogether, but for the most part, what's good in print journalism is, is available online now, and so we're, we're posed with this, this issue of how to be good consumers, how to become well-informed about what's going on in, in the world and even in our own little portions of the world. So I got this great question on one of, one of the comments on my uh, channel update for, for the year, the, the January channel update, and it's from uh, TF141Ghost. And it, it runs like this. This is a little off subject, but I, I would still enjoy your opinion. You mentioned The Atlantic and The Guardian, and I'm curious as to where you get your news from. As a young adult, as a young individual of voting age within the U.S., I feel like I have a duty to be knowledgeable and perhaps even active in regards to politics and current events in general. So my question to you is, where can I find the least biased news sources to form an educated opinion on current events? It's a great question. And I, I not only like the question, I also like this sort of set of assumptions that in order to, to really um, be the kind of person that you ought to be, it means being well-informed, being educated, and that being educated doesn't just mean having learned things, but being ready to take in new information and do something with it. And, and not just take in information as information, but to be able to put it into perspectives, to be able to, to fit it together. And in this, this case, it's, it's a question about uh, where do you get the most reliable or bias-free information from? Now, there's a lot of things that I, I want to say about this that, that fit in with the theme of, of this particular video. Um, I also want to, from the very beginning, sort of peel off some other issues that I think would be great to talk about in other videos. Um, one of those is, I, I'm not going to talk here about how to do research uh, or, you know, what the technosphere affords us in terms of research. And I'm not going to talk about how you would do that for older topics. I'm going to talk in this mostly about current events. Um, we're talking about news sources here, so that includes opinion sources as well. But we're not going to talk about things like Wikipedia or, or, or those sorts of things. Um, the other thing that I'm not going to go into, although it's a fascinating topic, uh, particularly from the vantage point that I have as a, a Gen Xer, is what the access to news has done to the way that we even look at news and the way that we participate in it and consume it and share it and, and talk about it and think about it. Um, there's some really important technological and generational changes that have taken place, and that's, that's a great topic, again, for another video. So to come back to this video, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about this, this question of bias and about news sources and about some strategies that uh, are, are available for, um, for a person who wants to be well-informed and wants to be careful about what they're, what they're assenting to, what they're saying, yeah, maybe it could be the case, and what they're saying, no, nah, that's, that's definitely uh, off there. So, from the beginning, I want to say there's going to be some sources where you can tell pretty quickly that they're biased 
and that their bias is going to really interfere with the kind of news that you're getting. Um, I would say that sources that are that are um, very far on one ideological spectrum or another, which um, don't make any sort of effort to understand their opposed ideological views, and there are many sources like that, are going to be very bad news sources. Um, bias is often quite a bit more subtle, um, particularly when we get to the middle parts of, of the spectrum. It's, it's interesting that, in my experience these days, Conservatives, um, many conservatives think that they're not biased at all in their, their views, in, in how they filter information and what they pay attention to. Um, but I would say that less conservatives fail to acknowledge their bias than, than liberals. Um, I, I see a lot of liberals who just assume that, that progressivism or a liberal point of view or however you want to look at it is just the status quo, and which is funny because that means they're actually conservatives in a certain respect, doesn't it, um, in the most banal way. And that this is just the way that, that reasonable you know, people think about it. And that's a, that's a clear case of, of bias. Um, so... Not everything is going to fit on an ideological spectrum, of course. As a matter of fact, we should probably think of ideological dimensions. Um, but there will be a lot of cases like that where you sort of red flags go, go up or alarm bells go off as you're reading something and you're like, man, this, this person really has an axe to grind. Uh, and not only does he have an axe to grind, sounds like he's from a group that really has an axe to grind. That should probably make you not necessarily reject that information source altogether, because sometimes they, they will come up with something that the other people aren't willing to look at, but to, to bracket it to a certain extent, to say, I'm not sure what I'm going to get from this, but I'm not going to take this as my, my prime source. Um, I think that it's very important at this point in, in our society, in, in our development, to do what I, I call metaphorically triangulation with respect to, to news. By triangulation, I don't mean just using three sources. I mean using a variety of sources which you make a habit of going to from time to time to see what sort of stories are, are popping up. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. If you're going to a variety of different sources, it's not just how a particular story is reported where the bias comes in. It's whether a story is even worth reporting on at all or whether it's worth researching. Um, you, if you get yourself a wide range of information sources, and I'm not just saying news organizations too. I'll talk about other uh, groups and, and uh, sites and, and things like that that you might want to take a look at. But if you get yourself a variety, you can get a sense about what's, what's going on uh, in, a, in a much better way than if you're just reading the New York Times or the Washington Post or you know Fox News or CNN. Uh, uh, MSNBC or, or CBS or, or whatever. I would also suggest that it's important to include a spectrum, particularly for an American, a spectrum of non-American news. And there are some major outlets that I think are particularly important to put into the mix. BBC is one of them. Um, Al Jazeera is, a, is another. Um, but I think it's also important for, for you to look at the sites that are available for French news sources, for Italian news sources, for Brazilian news sources, for African news sources, for Chinese news, news sources that are available in English. Or if you can actually read the foreign languages, I mean, that's a great way to practice it, but it's also a great way to, to get information. I think that that's a, a very useful thing to do. And that takes some time. I'm not saying that you would have to read every single one of these every day or check out every story, but um, it's a good thing to, to make a regular practice out of. And I think one way to sort of institutionalize this for yourself is if you're using Firefox or Chrome or, 
whatever. I know that with Firefox, I've got my, my bookmarks bar across the top, and I have one particular uh, folder in there that's just labeled News and Opinion, and it's got drop-down menus, and some of, you know, there's other folders under it, some with major news sources, and what I include as major news sources is not just, you know, some of the big papers or or outlets like that, or, or Reuters, where a lot of these stories are coming from anyway, or AP, but also China Times, or, or China, you know, Chinese financial uh, 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 sites, and, and the India Times, and, you know, you want to get a, a, a good spectrum of, of representation in there. And now how is that going to help you with, with bias? Because I'm supposed to be talking about bias. Well, you know, when you see people reporting things from different angles, it's not as if you're going to find one that's totally without bias, most likely. But you can play them off against each other. And you can, you can almost by doing something like a Venn diagram, see what they actually have in common that they agree on, and then see where the penumbras on the other side go off. And, you know, where it might be coming from their emphasis on this and where it might be coming from their emphasis on or interest in or, or bias against this. So those are, those are important um, strategies to pursue. I think it's also very important that you don't restrict yourself to news sources. A lot of news sources... A lot of websites, Economist is a great example, you know, for, for this, will not only have straight out reporting, which oftentimes, you know, is going to require that the reporter uh, work a lot of contacts, look at things from a particular perspective, which is going to introduce some, some degree of bias, right? Some things are going to be emphasized, other things not. It's going to rely on the, the reporter's judgment ultimately and putting together the viewpoints that they're they're analyzing and then and then synthesizing into their, their article. But there's not only going to be reporting, there's going to be opinion pieces. And I think that it's important to sample a wide spectrum of opinion across the board. Um, and there you know that there's some sort of bias going into it. Not all biases are equal. We're going to get to that in, in a little bit. But you want to hear what it is that intelligent people have to say, oftentimes very passionately, or at least argumentatively, about these topics. That's going to help you, not only to know what it is that these people you know, think, that's going to help you to weed through the BS as time goes on. It's also going to help to reveal to you what the sort of networks of, of ideas or constellations of concepts that constitute various ideological perspectives really look like so that you become quicker and, and, and more adept at identifying, oh, that's coming from this perspective. Oh, that's coming from this perspective. This is, looks like a blend of these two perspectives. The more that you do that sort of thing, the more that you're actually parsing good information like that, the closer you get to this approximation where bias becomes less and less of a, a problem, you're never going to eliminate bias completely. I think it's a mistake to try to look for totally unbiased sources because there's plenty of people who will peddle their sources as, as being so. I think that a lot of the readers of the New York Times think that the New York Times is totally without bias, um, and I think that you know a lot of people actually think that Fox is fair and balanced, and both parties are equally in the wrong about that. Um, but there are a lot of people making these sort of claims, a lot of organizations, a lot of sources making these claims, and you don't want to buy into them. What you want to be able to do is figure out what kind of bias it is, how bad the bias is. Is it really skewing the analysis that the person is engaging in? Is it making them overlook things that other news outlets are actually talking about? Or people in opinion pieces are saying, hey, you left out this bit of data over here that's, that's relevant to it. So that's, that's, that's very important. So there's this process of, of triangulation 
uh, not just triangulation, but also looking across various sources, not just going to news sources, but also to opinion sources. The other thing that I would add to that, oftentimes, at least in internet sources, when you have a story, there's going to be uh, things that are linked. Follow up those links. See where they go to. If somebody is reporting a story about um, this thing that happened down in Tennessee, odds are there's going to be a local paper or local news source that they're actually relying on. See what that story actually reads like. It might have less information, it might have more information, but you won't know until you actually dig and go into it. And the great thing is, with the internet, we're able to do that. We have this unparalleled power as consumers that we didn't have before to decide how we're going to follow out these these stories. It's really great. Um, let's talk now about, about bias itself. Are all biases equally bad? I don't think so. I think that we could talk about and I'm not going to like, you know, solve this this problem here. I just have some suggestions. But I think we can talk about different modes of bias. I think that um for instance, when somebody is biased in the sense of having a fixed position from which they're working, but they're self-conscious about that position and they've arrived at it through some sort of process of inquiry and they say, look, it's going to take an awful lot to convince me to not be a you know, progressive or not look at things in a neocon way or not you know, uh, analyze these things as a libertarian. I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't call that bias in the same respect as some sort of knee-jerk, emotional, unthinking, unreflective response that a lot of people have. So, and this, this applies very much to, to opinion pieces, you know, especially if they're from these, you know, institutes or think tanks that, that people have, um, you know, uh, they, they don't get to, to be in those unless they've actually invested quite a bit of time in, in acquiring information and parsing it and thinking about how to, how to analyze it. So, I don't think that we want to write off all biases as automatically being bad. Another thing that we want to remember too is bias can sometimes serve as a useful filter that allows people to see things that other people can't get because of the noise. Um, now oftentimes what they're getting are sort of artifacts of their imagination but sometimes it's actually true so you know you do want to be able to entertain the possibility that a bias source might be onto something. Um, I think that it's very good to acquire some sort of understanding about some of the main ideological perspectives that you're going to find within the discourses that you're you're interested in. And these are not all um, political or, or social ones um, when you're analyzing questions of religion. Religion reporting is, it tends to be pretty bad across the board and I would say that a lot of the biases in, in religion reporting stem from the ignorance on the part of reporters about what it is that they're, they're discussing. Um, and this, this extends through all sorts of cultural products too. You know, here, here's a great example. Um, Roman Catholics, you know, do they, do they go into a confessional to do a confession? Not very many of them, and that hasn't been the case for a couple generations. But, you know, movies and TV shows always portray it like that because that's the iconic representation. And if you're a reporter and you don't really know much about this because you're un, unchurched and you, you know, you, you've lived a very secular life, you're going to assume that that's the case because it's part of the social imaginary that you're participating in. Um, likewise, do we use the electric chair when it comes to capital punishment, or do most states actually use lethal injection? Most went to lethal injection a long time ago, but that's not quite as dramatic. And so people talk in, in, in terms of the, these, these things. So you, you want to 
develop a knack for telling when somebody doesn't know the whole story, when they didn't ask the right questions, when they made the wrong sort of blanket assumptions. Uh, and that's going to come with time. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm responding to a young person here who's, who's very well motivated to, to learn and, and know. Um, you don't, by the way, you don't have to be 100% infallible to, to detect bias in somebody else, to suspect that there's bias going on. There's nothing that says that you yourself have to become the pr premier information source in order to criticize other information sources. Um, but it is, it is good to know um, something about those that one is attributing bias to. If you want to say that a source is biased, you should be able to articulate to yourself what exactly in it is biased. If the best that you can come up with is, I don't know, I just have a weird feeling about it, that's probably not enough to say that the source is biased. You want to be able to, to determine what it is it that, that, that they're leaving out, what is it that clearly they're not interested in, in pursuing further. Um, Something else that I think that we want to think about is would we want to remove all bias? Or are there some upsides to bias? I mentioned before that, you know, the, the biased will often be, you know, quite emotionally invested in, in something and, and pursue it in ways that other people won't, uh, those who have other biases. Um, I think that it's also nice to have a, a variety of perspectives. You know, there, there's something about pluralism that I think is quite good. Um, you know, people arrive at, at, at the biases that they have sometimes through indoctrination, sometimes through um, you know social processes of which they're they're unaware, um, sometimes through you know having things merely imposed on them and having to to parrot them. But a lot of times people arrive at, at, at the, the perspectives that they have through actually carrying out some sort of process, of probably a flawed and imperfect process, but a process nonetheless of dialogue, inquiry, analysis, debate, and then they come to their best viewpoint on it. And, and oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll find that, that people, quite a few people, not everybody, there are some genuine ideologues out there, and there are some people who just have, you know, personal problems and are, are unwilling to, to acknowledge that they're, they're not as certain about things as they, they think they are. But there's a lot of people who are quite willing to say, well, give me some other information and I'll, I'll try to see if I can take this in and make some sense out of it and, and uh, revise my, my picture. I think that's one of the things that, that we want to be able to do as well is to revise our, our pictures of, of these, these information sources. We need to keep learning and revising which ones we think are particularly reliable sources and which ones we, we don't. And probably for a younger person, even for some older people, you know, if you're undergoing a process of education, uh, a life change, that may that may lead you to some sources and away from other sources. You may actually say, yeah, you know, I used to really like The Economist. I thought their analyses were spot on, but I, I don't know. I feel that they've been slipping lately, or now I have a different perspective, a broader perspective, and I see that theirs is a bit narrow in this respect. By the way, this is a bad example because The Economist is, is actually quite a diverse news source. It has some great blogs uh, with, with a variety of perspectives. Um, but you, you see where that's going. As you're, you're learning more, you're going to incorporate more and more news and information and opinion sources into your manifold by which you're sort of sifting out current events. What I'd like to close with is by thinking about social media and giving a few pointers and talking about a few of the, <clears throat> the, the issues and challenges with respect to, to that. So I think that um, when it comes to news sources, provided you're not just sampling purely partisan outlets, you can use Twitter, 
You can use Facebook with your likes. You can use LinkedIn. You can use Google Plus as ways to access information. I think Reddit could also be quite useful for this, but I can't talk much about Reddit because I don't really use it. Um, there's, a, there's all sorts of other sources as well that I think could be quite, quite useful. YouTube is, is another good, good example. Um, a lot of people used to get their news through, through email um, bursts. They would you know, set their email to, to get you know, whenever there was a news story published about this or that. I don't know that many people who do that these days, in part because you tend to get way too many emails. But if you know a particularly good blog um, and it's about something that you're, you're very interested in with politics or culture or religion or you know, regional affairs or, or something like that, or food, who knows what, what you're interested in, uh, it could be good to set, set alerts of that sort so that you get that information. But, you know, I know for myself, I, I have a variety of different people that I follow on Twitter, and I've got all these LinkedIn contacts, and, you know, I've got all these Facebook friends, and then I have my Facebook page, and my Facebook page actually likes a whole bunch of other pages. And through these, these, these uh, social media outlets... I'm getting exposed to a lot of different stories that I might otherwise miss out on. Because, you know, I have friends who will say, I like this, this blog, or I'm going to link this MSNBC article, um, or I'm going to tweet this, this uh, article that I think is important. And now there's not enough time to actually read everything, of course, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty selective in, in that. And I suspect that one of the things, actually... I said I was going to close with talking about social media. What I'm going to close with is this. One of the things that the, the technosphere makes us conscious of when it comes to news is just how little news we're actually able to take in. Because if you're doing the sort of strategies that I was talking about, you know, having a variety of different news sources and trying to go to them, you're not going to read every story. You're not going to follow up every possibility. You only have the same 24 hours a day that, you know, back in 1940 people had and back in 240 AD people had and that in, you know, whatever time we pick in the future people are going to have. That's a constant. You only got so much time. So the question is, which stories are you going to, to allow to inform you by you doing the work of, you know, clicking on them and... and running your eyeballs over them and trying to keep your, your brain active in, in parsing them. Um, is that a bad thing, this, this awareness? It could induce a kind of depression. I can't really know anything. You know, I can't possibly follow things. It could induce a kind of anxiety. I'm always, you know, in, I'm always out of the know when it comes to important news items. I think it'd be better if it just induces a kind of humility. There's a lot of things that we just don't know about. If we want to know a lot more about this one, that means that all this other stuff has got to wait or, or not happen. And the news cycle constantly keeps going on. Um, I think that the more that you, that you consume news in a self-conscious way to try to avoid bias, to try to use different sources, the faster that you get at... at Telling what's what's worth reading from what's not reading worth reading, and the the better you get about putting together this entire constellation of ideas that you use to locate things. But even then, you know, you're you're still only taking in a, a, a portion of what's available, and I think that's okay. That's part of the human condition. Um, and so that's, that's where I'll, I'll leave off. That's pointing us towards an important facet of, of human experience in this, this world that we now call the technosphere.